Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Pet Parenting Reset. So a few weeks ago, we had an incredibly, incredibly amazing guest, Dr. Odette Suter. She is a holistic veterinarian. If you haven't already listened to that podcast, I highly recommend you go back. It was episode 41. So Dr. Suter sent out a to everybody on her email list a free PDF on a holistic pr- approach to creepy crawlies. So we're talking about mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, all the nasty things <laughs> that we don't love to think about or talk about. And it was it was free. Um, I'm going to link this PDF in the show notes. So you can go to the petparentingreset.com, um, click on show notes, and you can get this for yourself. But I wanted to go over it with you because... She has some, a little, a little bit, a little bit different information than what I have put out in the past. So I wanted to go over this PDF with you because she has a little bit different, you know, different information than what I have given you in the past on this topic. Now, yes, we have talked about fleas and ticks a few times. There's probably more information on Patreon than anywhere else. Uh, If you're not already part of the Patreon, I I do hope to see you over there. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. Um, You get lots of PDF files on dog training, on uh, health, on problem issues with your cats. There's so much that you get just for joining, um, just, just at the dollar tier. Of course, there are other tiers, but even at the dollar tier, you get so much information uh, and you get to be part of a really cool community and and help me to continue to bring content like this to you and other pet parents like you. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the information in this PDF on a holistic approach to creepy crawlies. So there are, you know, depending on where you live, heartworm prevalence can vary. But what we know, of course, is that heartworm is something that our dogs get from mosquitoes, but not all mosquitoes. Uh, Again, I know I've talked about this specifically on Patreon. I'm not sure that I've talked about this anywhere else. But so heartworm, let's talk about heartworm Uh, to know when to test and what stage of the worm cycle is addressed with preventatives, (laughs) preventatives, <laughs> it is important to understand the life cycle of the actual parasite itself. If there are no mosquitoes around, there are, there's no transmission. So we used to live in San Diego for a while with Kim. Now, of course, I'm from Virginia, but we lived in San Diego for a little while with our dog, Kim. There were, for many, many years, no mosquitoes. The last two years we were there, there were a couple, nothing significant. So in that instance, in San Diego, why would I have given my dog heartworm preventative? Like there's, there's no chance of transmission because there were no mosquitoes. That's just an example. Now we live in Texas. There are loads of mosquitoes. It's May. Um, in fact, the, the date I'm recording this is May 10th. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna publish later on, but May 9th yesterday was the first day I saw, I saw mosquitoes everywhere yesterday. <laughs> we have mosquitoes here. Um, so my approach to keeping my dog healthy and heartworm free has to change. That's one of the reasons why I had so much content on heartworm specifically on Patreon, because I was doing a ton of research for it before we moved. So that's, that's why there's so much information on Patreon. Again, check it out. Um, you can get to, you can go to the petparentingreset.com and right there in the navigation bar, you can click on Patreon and get there. And like I said, you can join for as little as a dollar a month. Anyway, you'll get all of that back content. Um, if the temperature is below 57 degrees Fahrenheit, development of larvae in the mosquito is halted before they become infective. So below 57 degrees, again, is too cold. 
uh, mosquitoes are not going to be out <laughs> at all. Uh, they are, their development is completely halted. They're not going to be coming out. So again, below 57 degrees, why would we, why would we give preventatives? Here are the prerequisites for heartworm infection. Uh, you need the right climate. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in water. So if there's no water, there are no mosquitoes. You need the right temperature for the right length of time for maturation to actually take place in mosquito larvae. So again, it needs to be at least over 57 degrees um, for a period of time for the larvae to actually even develop. With the warmer temperature, the faster maturation of the larvae to uh, the, what they call L3, there are different L numbers in the maturation of a larvae to a mosquito. At 64 degrees Fahrenheit, it takes approximately one month for most mosquito species, and most mosquito species only live three to four weeks. So the um, mosquito must be able to suck blood from an infected dog about two weeks prior. Only the full-grown L3 larvae are actually infectious. Mosquitoes must be female, and the L3 larvae must actually get into the dog. And you, your dog would need to have a weakened immune system because if they have a tip-top immune system, if they are just out there rocking and rolling and thriving and they have an incredible immune system, their immune system is going to kill off these larvae, these uh, heartworm larvae, right? So preventatives for heartworm, do's and don'ts. Okay, so preventative, the traditional preventatives that are on the market for heartworm, they only kill the heartworm larvae that entered the body since the last dose. Dosing every 45 days with conventional drugs, absolutely stay away from the injectables. Those are like the ProHeart 6 and 12. The injectables are, are hor horribly, horribly, um, like death rates are crazy. Once it's in your dog, it can't be taken out. Don't do it. Don't give heartworm preventative the same day that you give other preventatives. That means stay away from combo drugs that kill everything. So if, you, if your vet is trying to give you something that kills fleas and ticks and heartworm, don't do it. You want to do one at a time. Avoid all plus products. Those are, again, are combo, combo products. Um, if your dog needs to be dewormed or ha you know, has any sort of GI parasites, Again, these are something you want to do at separate times. If you're using herbal, herbal preventatives or even no preventative at all, you're going to want to test more often than yearly. Um, for some veterinarians, Dr. Suter says three to four times a year. I would say two to three, two, two times a year is probably going to be really, really good. Um, you're probably going to be able to catch anything you need to catch, especially if you're doing everything else you need and you, you feel, you know, if your dog is super healthy, thriving, um, no, you know, they have no issues. They are eating a species appropriate diet. You're not over vaccinating. You're not giving them chemicals. They don't live in, in an environment that is overly laden with chemicals. Yada, yada. If you're doing all the things, if you are that 2.0 pet parent, um, you probably can get away with twice a year. Detox for seven days after treatment. Dr. Odette Suter is giving milk thistle as an example. Do not use any flea tick or heartworm preventative in animals that already have seizures because all of these are neurologics and they can cause seizures in dogs. So if your dog already has seizures, this is going to exacerbate the problem. If you are one of those people that you absolutely are going to use some sort of preventative offered by your veterinarian. You're not going to go the herbal route. You're not going to go the natural route. Um, Dr. Odette Suters says that Interceptor is the safest, which is the um, actual term of the drug is milbamycin, but it, it goes by the label Interceptor. So that's what she's saying is the best or the safest of all drugs that you can get from your veterinarian. Now, natural prevention, you can treat the environment. Beneficial nematodes eat mosquito larvae. Stay inside during high flying times, which is going to be dusk and dawn. Um, that's what I was saying yes, uh, that yesterday <laughs> I saw a ton of mosquitoes. It was at dusk. Uh, 
spray your animal with a safe deterrent. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute because she has one and then I'm going to tell you about one. Consider an herbal preventative such as HWF from Amber Naturals. Um, any Again, anything that I'm talking about in this PDF, anything that I'm going over in this PDF, I'm going to go over a little bit more into detail when we're done with the PDF, but this PDF is going to be available to you on the show notes. Test three to four times a year. Again, she says if you're using herbal or no prevention, healthy animals are much less attractive to pests and have a strong immune system. So again, that is what I really, really focused on with Kim with the, our move from San Diego into Central Texas was making sure her immune system is in tip top shape so that I can feel comfortable using natural remedies to keep her safe from fleas and ticks and mosquitoes. Okay, so fleas. Fleas are annoying, <laughs> but they can transmit tapeworm and Bartonella, which is what we called cat scratch fever. Some animals are actually allergic to the flea saliva. So if you've heard of flea dermatitis, it's because they're allergic to the saliva of the fleas. One flea, literally one singular flea is enough to trigger that response. So here are the facts from Dr. Odette Suter. The number of fleas on your animal represent only 5% of the total population. It takes at least three months to get rid of fleas due to their life cycle. Isoxazoline preventatives, Brevecto, Credelio, Nexgard, Empirica are dangerous, like super dangerous and can destroy your animal's lives. I recently did a YouTube and Rumble video on isoxazoline. Um, you can get to that by searching the Pet Parenting Reset on uh, YouTube or Rumble because, oh my goodness, whew, what isoxazoline can do to your animal is horrific. I would highly recommend you checking that out. Um, okay. Prevention for fleas. Healthy animals are much less attractive. That is the number one prevention, right guys? For almost anything, healthy animals are much less attractive and much less, um, prone to disease. Use flea comb daily before entering the house. If chemical treatment is necessary, according to Dr. Odette Suter, Comfortis is the safest and detox after chemical use. So detoxing is really an interesting thing. Dr. Suter held a, uh, I think it, it, it starts May 13th through the 18th or 19th, a dog detox summit. Oh my goodness. Check it out if you haven't already. Um, detoxing is really, really interesting. I, I did, I started Kim on a detox. It's the very first one we've ever done. I'm, I'm, I observed her for one week with this detox that I got from Vital Pet Health. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to do a Patreon post about it because it was interesting. Um, I'd never done a detox with her before. I've never done a detox on myself. Uh, I'm very interested in doing a detox on myself, but anyway, detox after chemical use. Okay. So indoors, when we're talking about fleas and we're talking about indoors, flea stopper, Adult fleas and larvae, boric acid, non-toxic, stays in carpet even after vacuuming. One application lasts one year. So I guess that's a product called Flea Stopper. I'll have to look that up for y'all. Uh, flea Busters is another product. Food grade dimetaceous earth dusting. But that is interesting. You have to avoid inhalation for you and for your pets, especially for your dogs and cats. Uh, well, and um, other pets as well, any pets you have. Vacuum, vacuum, vacuum all of your surfaces, including the car. Wash pet bedding often in hot water. I don't know how often you guys wash your pet bedding. I wash it at least once a month, and I have a lot of pet. I have a lot of pet beds. Let me tell you. So for outdoor, we want a mosquito barrier, and according to Dr. Odette Suter, garlic is the best. Um, I have added garlic to Kim's diet. We've talked about garlic many, many times especially on Patreon. That's the safest place for me to talk about it. Um, it's so many people think it's toxic to dogs. If used in the appropriate way and appropriate amounts, it is not. In fact, it is quite beneficial. So highly recommend checking that uh, post out as well. So ticks, let's talk about ticks, guys. They can cause disease through transmitting bacteria and viruses um, like Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, 
and others. When I adopted Kim, she tested positive for ehrlichiosis. Um, and what they, I ultimately found out from the rescue because they didn't tell me this when I first adopted her, I had to go back to them and be like, what, what the heck is going on? Like the vet wants to put her on another 30 days of antibiotics. Has she already been on antibiotics? Really? Anyway, once you test positive, your dog tests positive for ehrlichiosis, even if they have gone through the treatment protocol, which is, I don't want to get on a tangent, but um, silly if they don't have any uh, signs of illness. But anyway, um, it's like 30 days, I believe, of antibiotics. They are always going to test positive for ehrlichiosis. It's just one of those weird things. Um, these, uh, Dr. Odette Suter, these diseases can also be transmitted through other insects. So tips for, tri uh, <laughs> that's, that wouldn't be right. Tips for ticks. <laughs> Here we go. Healthy animals are much less attractive. Again, what have we said this whole time? Healthy animals are much less attractive. Test for tick-borne diseases one to two times a year or after a tick bite. Uh, keep the tick that you remove from your dog if a dog if a tick does attach to your dog and you remove it you can send it to the tick research lab of pennsylvania apparently this is free um, make sure that you check your animals daily for ticks use a lint roller after a hike in the woods and sh make sure to check yourself off to often as well uh, there is another tip here from dr odette Suter. it is cystus in canis tea one teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight by mouth daily keeps ticks away. That's interesting. Um, a raw amber stone collar also helps to keep ticks away. There's a homeopathic remedy called Ledum, L-E-D-U-M, 200C, uh, four to eight weeks as a preventative, decreases ticks. And either the 200C or 1M Ledum for three days to treat disease. If treatment is necessary, switch up your herbs and remedies every two to three weeks because Bor Borrelia changes shape to evade uh, whatever herbs and remedies. So you're going to want to switch up the herbs and remedies you're using uh, to treat uh, any, any tick-borne illness or disease. For outdoors, uh, you can use something called tick tubes. These are biodegradable and made of permethrin. Keep your grass short, and you can also plant deer-resistant plants because deer are um, kind of notorious <laughs> for moving ticks around. For both fleas and ticks, oral and topical products do not repel fleas and ticks. That is a common misconception that people have that these um, medications that you get from your veterinarian actually repel flea and ticks. They do not. They only kill them once they attach to your dog or cat. There are no guarantees your pet will re remain free of pest-borne diseases, especially with oral drug preventatives. Fleas and ticks don't like lavender, sage, mint, wormwood, rosemary, and marigolds. So we've talked about this on Patreon as well. Planting uh, plants in your yard around your home that are natural bug repellents. I currently have lavender and catnip uh, in my yard. I'm planning on planting more. Catnip is in the mint family, if you didn't know that. So lavender, sage, mint, wormwood, rosemary, marigolds. I am also planning on uh, planting a ton of rosemary around uh, my fencing. So rosemary, if you don't know, is very... Once you plant it, that stuff goes everywhere. It's going to take over. So <laughs> I'm planning on planting it around my fencing to kind of put a perimeter, uh, if you, if you will, around my backyard with, with rosemary. Um, essential oil sprays and topicals such as Alzu and Vetri Repel are also good for both fleas and ticks. Coconut oil topically deters insects due to the ingredient lauric acid. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about essential oils and coconut oil in just a moment. And then garlic. Again, I've gone in detail on how to appropriately feed garlic to your dog. That post is also on Patreon. So making your own um, sprays for keeping 
bugs and pests off of your pets. This is actually Dr. Becker's recipe, but she's including it here uh, on Dr. Suter's PDF. You can mix the following, a quarter cup of lemon juice with two cups of water, plus four tablespoons of vanilla extract and 20 drops of catnip oil. Mix that together in a spray bottle. Um, you don't shake it, kind of rock it back and forth to get it mixed well together. And you can use that as a spray to keep fleas and ticks from wanting to get on your pet. Um, alternatively, there you, you can do this different spray. It's eight ounces of water, four ounces of apple cider vinegar, 10 drops of neem oil, not the essential oil, but the actual neem oil itself, 10 drops of catnip oil, five drops of one of the following. Now this is for dogs only, by the way, guys, lemon, lemongrass, eucalyptus, or geranium essential oil. Um, mix those in a bottle, again, a spray bottle. Sh don't shake it, rock it back and forth. And that also is going to be good for dogs only uh, to keep fleas and ticks off of them. Now, okay. I have talked about natural ways to keep fleas and ticks away from your pets a number of times. Essential oils, the only essential oils I ever recommend for anybody, for your dogs, for your cats, even for me, that is just about the only thing I use for me, is Animalio. Highly, highly recommend them. They are the only veterinary grade essential oil I know of um, and, and the only essential oil I ever recommend <laughs> to anyone. Coconut oil, I absolutely love cocoa therapy, coconut oil. They're incredible. They're uh, twin sisters, and it's a family farm where they grow coconuts, and they have been for generations. It's just beautiful. It's all organic. Absolutely love, love, love them and their products. And then again, garlic. Guys, garlic, I, I, I had a hard time the first time I, I heard, no, you actually can feed your dog garlic, because I had been so conditioned to, oh my God, never, ever, ever will I ever, ever, ever give garlic to my dog. It's so toxic. It's so terrible for them that it took me a little while to be like, okay, what's the real information here? What's the real data on garlic and my dogs? Now, as a side note, never, ever, ever give garlic to your cats. Cats cannot have garlic. Dogs, however, <laughs> when used appropriately, in the appropriate amounts, um, garlic is, is okay. Like, in fact, there are quite a few benefits. So, um, again, for me and Kim, she's getting tested twice a year for heartworm. Um, she just got tested in March of this year, and it was negative. Yay. Um, we are, we're doing everything that I know to do currently. I'm starting to plant more plants in the yard that are, uh, bug repellent naturally bug repellent um, she is vitally healthy and I am very confident in her health um, she eats a species appropriate diet she gets transfer factor vitamins every day we're we're doing awesome like she is just rocking and rolling and vitally thriving throughout her life I'm happy about that we also use Animalio essential oils mixed with water in a spray bottle um, to help keep pests from wanting to even jump on her. So Evict and Away are two of the blends that Animalio has for um, flea and tick prevention, for pest control. And I love both of them and I rotate them. We also feed her garlic. Um, there is a specific protocol for feeding garlic to dogs. Again, that is all listed on Patreon. Um, but basically, you feed it daily for, I think, two weeks to build it up in the body. And then you can cut back to feeding it two to three times a week. And the amount depends on your dog's weight. So um, there's, there's a lot of research that has gone into this, exactly how to do it, because it's not like you can... Just buy chopped garlic at the grocery store. You need to start with fresh, organic garlic. Um, source locally, if possible. And you need to chop it right when you are going to be feeding your dog. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of really good research and data as to how it works, why it works, and how to use it with your dog. So don't be afraid of it. <laughs> um, 
And I do highly rec- recommend the natural route because the <sighs> flea tick heartworm preventatives, the preventatives um, that are available on the market today, if you have not had the risk versus reward conversation with your veterinarian about them, I highly recommend you call your veterinarian right now and say, we haven't had the risk versus reward conversation on this flea and tick medication or this heartworm medication. And I need to hear, I need to hear it because I'm not, I'm not convinced that this is um, the right thing for my animal moving forward. I, I, I highly recommend you have that conversation with your veterinarian because they need to list out all of the risks of everything they are advising you to give your pet. Ultimately, you are the decision maker, and it is your responsibility to do as much research as possible to make the appropriate decisions for your animal. Your veterinarian is part of your pet's medical team, and you are the head of that medical team. So with that being said, (laughs) um, go to the show notes to get your copy of this PDF from Dr. Odette Suter. It is at thepetparentingreset.com. Click on show notes and find this episode. And yeah, so I hope that's helpful. I hope it kind of breaks things down for you uh, in a, in a, I didn't want to make this too long of of a a podcast episode because I wanted you to, to be able to walk away and say, okay, I understand that this is, this is what I can do. This is what I probably should do. This is probably what I shouldn't do. I need to have this conversation with my vet. There are really good natural alternatives let's let's look at this route moving forward but again the absolute best thing you can do for your pet whether we're talking about fleas ticks mosquitoes whether we're talking about disease which by the way is inflammation in the body disease is bred from inflammation regardless of what we're talking about the absolute best defense is a good offense and the best offense is that your pet is vitally healthy making sure their immune system is in tip-top shape. That starts with feeding a species-appropriate diet, reducing the chemical load in the body, reducing the chemical load in the environment, reducing, um, you know, not over-vaccinating. There's there's not a whole lot. There's like a a core of things to do to, that will radically change the health of your pet. By the way, all of these same things will radically change your health as well. So with that, I'm going to end today's podcast. Um, I hope y'all are having a really, really wonderful day wherever you are, um, wherever you're listening. And if you haven't rated the podcast already, please do so. I've talked about Patreon a lot today. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, am I? I'm going to ask you one more time to go join the Patreon. Go to the petparentingreset.com and click on Patreon in the top navigation window. With that, I'm going to say, give your pet some extra love from me. Until next week, bye guys. Oh, oh, oh.